Ghana Broadcasting Corporation has three gates. One is used by employees and all visitors, both vehicular and otherwise. To the east of gate one is gate two, which is used by employees. Facing gate one directly to the north is gate three. The dissidents surprised the guards on duty and in the ensuring battle, more than 10 government troops lost their lives. The dissidents lost one man, Alidu Salifu. The rest of the defenders escaped into thin air. Radio Ghana was now in the hands of the dissidents. But the coup failed due to the following factors. The officer who had infiltrated into Ghana from Togo the previous day with five other ranks had collected a speech prepared at Asha Fort for the purpose. But Halid Ujiwa, who declared himself operations commander at the broadcasting house, refused to allow the officer to read the speech. Lieutenant Colonel Echol Dennis, still in his sleeping cloth, did not know of the plan to break jail and take over. He was also not allowed to read the speech. In fact, he told Jiwa that in the face of overwhelming government forces that could be mustered against them, he should delay an announcement of a takeover for a short while so he could go to his unit, the field engineers, and commandeer more material and troops. He had been arrested on Friday the 17th of June 1983 and most of his troops did not even know that he was no more the acting commander. While on his way to his unit, Lieutenant Colonel Echol Dennis heard the first announcement and thought they had lost the element of surprise by losing the advantage of keeping government forces guessing who the coup makers were and their possible strength. This is Carlos Halidu Jiwa. The little ammunition they had had been used in the battle for the broadcasting house. Besides, they had not been able to seize much ammunition from the government forces. Without replenishing both their human and material resources, they were doomed. Lieutenant Colonel Echo Dennis left Accra and headed towards the Ivory Coast border, some 200 miles away. On hearing the announcement of a takeover, officers of the Ghana Armed Forces refused to take instructions from Jiwa, a lance corporal and since under the circumstances they were the only people that could move troops, support could not be had. What Jiwa should have done to save himself in the coup should have been to have chosen his own other rank commander, order them to take over from the incumbent officers and then direct movement of troops and weapons to claim victory. It was only when he had realized that support was not forthcoming because he had insulted the sensibilities of the officer corps that he told the nation, we have fine officers like Lieutenant Colonel Echo Dennis with us here. But the question is, if you had them, then why were they not addressing the nation instead of you, a Lance Corporal? By 11.30 a.m., they decided on a tactical withdrawal and return when they had had no reinforcement. After about an hour, Captain Kwashiga and a few soldiers jumped over the common wall of the Ghana Film Corporation and entered the broadcasting house. By then, the dissidents had left the scene. Despite the setback, a few of the soldiers were still optimistic that they could retake the broadcasting house after they had made the tactical withdrawal. One such optimist was Tony Tekbo Heckley one of the soldiers accused of murdering the three high court judges and the retired army officer. He hijacked a Peugeot 544 caravan on the Ring Road Central and accompanied by two others, drove to the field engineers regiment on the Accra Tema Coastal Road 
Nieteshi. There, the boy and his companions started shooting into the air. Most of the soldiers in the camp either ran away or hid in their rooms. A few joined them. They broke into the ammunition depot and loaded as much ammunition as they could and carried it back into the caravan. On the main road, Tekpo stopped another Pedro caravan at gunpoint, threw the driver out and transferred some of the arms into it. Some of the new recruits also joined that vehicle. Their destination, the Insawan Median Prison. From the field engineers, they drove to the Ghana Military Academy and training school. They again ransacked the armory and took a few more rifles and weapons. At this stage, Tekpa was looking for a Kalgul staff gun and bomb. He had found the gun at the field engineers, but without the bomb, it was useless. But he all the same grabbed it and placed it in the getaway vehicle. It was at the military academy and training school that they heard that the broadcasting house had been retaken by government troops. Despite the announcement of a retakeover by the government troops, they pressed to the Insawan prison some 20 miles to the north of their position. The two Peugeot cars arrived at the prison gate at about 3 p.m. and they announced their presence again by firing several rounds into the air. Meanwhile, inside the prison yard, the detained soldiers had given up hope that they would be rescued. They had been prepared mentally for a couple of weeks for what took place that morning at the broadcasting house. It was not until the day before, however, that it was confirmed that the operation would come on the following day. Everybody was on edge. There were about 35 military intelligence men in detention. They had been arrested after the coup and deposited at the Nsawan prisons, seemingly forgotten. The unlucky ones had been killed, while a few had been severely beaten and then released after a few weeks in detention. In addition to these men, there were other soldiers who had been incarcerated for military-related offenses, among whom was awaiting trial as leader of the four soldiers who murdered the judges and the retired army officer. Before his arrest for the murder, Samuel America, the Lance Corporal, was the head of security at Radio Ghana. The soldiers in the block were very restive, for they were dying for action, but at the same time, there was this fear lurking behind their minds that their absence could affect the outcome in the long run. Their disappointment could therefore only be imagined when at around 12.30 p.m., they heard on the prison radio that the coup had been foiled. Everybody became despondent and some of the soldiers even cried. The shooting around 3 p.m. outside the main prison gate was therefore unexpected. All the warders on guard duty outside the main gate vanished, while those on duty inside found places to hide. Tekbo and his accomplices wasted a lot of time trying to break the lock of the main gate with bullets. Almost half an hour was spent there before they broke in. When they entered, the first person they saw was a non-commissioned officer called Dowanu sitting in the reception area. One of the soldiers pressed his trigger. He died instantly. Another non-commissioned officer, Amate Ai, was hit in the stomach as he fell down bleeding. The bullet that hit Amate Ai ricocheted and hit a prisoner who was walking towards the administration block in the inner part of his right thigh. He also fell down bleeding. This third casualty was Chris Asher the chief of Achim Osurasi and a lawyer by profession. The invaders went to the blocks demanding the keys from the warders to release their colleagues. It was only at block 4 
that the officer said he did not have the key. This was Corporal Amadeke's block and he told Tekbo that the officer was lying. After arguing for some time about the key, Amadeke insisted that the key was in the officer's pocket and that if he would not give it to him, then Tekbo should shoot him. Immediately he heard he was to be shot, the officer, known in the prison as Corner Corner, produced the key from his pocket and opened the gate to the block, allowing Amadeke and a few soldiers to release themselves. They went to the infirmary and released Jandu, another of the four soldiers accused of murdering the three high court judges and the retired army officer. The soldiers then made a run for freedom. Outside, they were asked to pick up guns from a vehicle which they had also hijacked. The second death at the Ensawan prison occurred here. One of the soldiers took a cogged G3 and pressed the trigger. The gun went off, killing him on the spot. Another military intelligence man made a similar mistake, but he was lucky. He was hit in the arm and was admitted at the Ensawan hospital. These initial setbacks notwithstanding, the soldiers got into the three vehicles and set out on their way to retake Radio Ghana, four hours after government forces had occupied it. A few minutes after their departure, a marshy jet bomber flew over their prison. In the cockpit, the squadron leader could only have a bill, a close friend of Jerry John Rawlings. The motley group of about 30 soldiers were very determined to retake the broadcasting house as they sped on the Insawam road towards Accra. On their way towards the capital Accra, the convoy of escaped prisoners reached a police barrier some 10 miles outside Accra on June 19th. There, they were stopped, but before the police could check the vehicles, the invaders overpowered them, took all their arms and continued their journey to Accra. That was the major mistake they made. The policemen had telecommunication equipment which the soldiers did not see. Immediately they left the barrier, the policemen telephoned the armed squadron division of the Ghana police force based at the police depot about four miles away. Two armored personnel carriers were alerted and dispatched to intercept the invaders. When the convoy reached Apenkwa, five miles from the central business district of Accra, they spotted the armored vehicles coming towards them. The convoy halted and Captain O, the most senior officer around, took charge. Armed with AK-47s and assorted rifles, all odds were greatly against them. Directing his men, Captain O gave orders for them to take cover under the motorway extension bridge, which was under construction by then. He, Captain O, then stood on top of the bridge, directing their fire. Immediately, some of the soldiers spotted the approaching armored vehicles. They lost hope and fled into different directions. Only a handful of men were left to fight the armored vehicles. Around the same time, a jet bomber was head human in the distance. This imposed further fear into the soldiers, causing more of them to disappear into thin air. Those left included Captain Owu, ex-warrant officer Baba Abu, Corporal Samuel Amedeka, Tekmo, Jandu, Al-Hassan, and a few others. Against all odds, they stood their grounds. As Tekmo described the scene, I adjusted my AK-47 and timed the bomber. As it approached, I let out two quick volleys. The plane suddenly swerved and never returned again. The helicopter also sent to the scene of the fight was believed to have had its rotor blade hit because of its sudden change of tone. It also departed the battleground never to return again. At this time, all the heat was coming from the armored vehicles. Protected by the thick concrete pillars of the extended motorway bridge, the soldiers held up for some time. Then they put one of the armored vehicles out of action. It was at this point that Tekbo recalled that he grabbed the empty cargo stab gun from the back of the Peugeot car, walked into the open and pretended he was taking aim. 
Immediately the driver of the armored car saw the cargo stop gun, he reversed and sped away. The small force won the battle of Apenkwa, but most of their men had disappeared from the scene. The mission to retake the broadcasting house had to be aborted as they did not have enough men to retake it. Most of those present at the time were not even aware of a rendezvous, for apart from Tony Tekpo, who was amongst the original group freed from the Ashaford prison, most of the others were from the Insawan prison and did not know of the rendezvous in case things did not work out as planned. As a result, they decided to break up and go their separate ways. Captain Owu finally found his way into the Ivory Coast. Tekpo, America, Ahasan and Jandu drove to Sukura, a suburb of Accra. The case of Abu Baba was very precarious as that of Jandu and others. He had taken part in the 23rd November 1982 coup attempt. When they left the scene at Apenkwa, Abu Baba took to the motorway extension and walked towards Dakuman. Some civilians recognized him as one who partook in the Battle of Apenkwa with the police armored cars. They arrested him for being one of the dissidents. It was however to avoid being identified that he threw his rifle away. Now there he was having been arrested by unarmed civilians. One of the soldiers who had just fought with him at the bridge saw his predicament and armed with his rifle approached the crowd holding the soldier under arrest. As he got closer, he spoke to Abu Baba in the Hausa dialect to fall to his knees. He obeyed and as he did so, the soldier opened fire on his captors, injuring a few of them. At this point, the crowd all disappeared into different directions. The two soldiers then went their way. They both ended up in Lome Togo. When Tekmo, Jandu, Amadika and Al Hassan left Apenkwa in the hijacked Peju caravan, they drove to Tekmo's brother's place at Sukura, a suburb of Accra. When they got there, everybody in the house was scared. This is because their names were all over the airwaves as being wanted for subversion. The news of their arrival in the area spread quickly and within a short time, PDCs and WDCs started to gather around the house. Realizing the situation, they got into their hijacked car. Just when they were about to take off, a PDC policeman opened fire on Tekbo in the back, just below the shoulder blade. He slammed in the car bleeding. Samuel Amedika, the leader of the soldiers who murdered the three high court judges and the retired army officer, took his AK-47, aimed carefully and shot the policeman dead. Then they took off. At this stage, Tekbo was bleeding and losing strength but they could not take him to a hospital for fear of being reported to the security agencies. The following day, 20th June 1983, soldiers were deployed all over the capital Accra and its environs searching for the dissidents. The four, Tekbo, Jandu, America and Hassan were still driving around in their stolen Peugeot caravan. Samuel America was the first to detach himself from the group. After this, Yandu drove to Potosu, where another of his brother lived. Yandu then took Al Hassan to Tudu, where he borrowed some money from relatives for Al Hassan. Al Hassan was later spotted by the security agents and arrested. After being beaten and tortured, he gave out the whereabouts of Yandu. The army moved into Tudu in full force, closing all possible escape routes. He heard military voices ordering him to come out from his hiding place. Realizing he had been cornered, he walked out to find armored cars and troops surrounding the house. With them was Al Hassan. They were taken to the castle guard room, where the soldiers took ten beating them. At about 8 p.m., Jandu was dragged from the guardroom to the beach by the castle and dumped on the sandbags. Are you all my he was later sent to the BNI headquarters. He was later executed. A 
as being part of the soldiers who murdered the judges and the army officer, and also being part of their attempted coup. Nothing was heard of Al Hassan again after this incident. Tony Tekpo Heckley, in his attempt to flee Ghana, was arrested at the Ghana Togo border near Ho. He was later executed as being part of those who murdered the three judges and the retired army officer and also being part of the June 19th attempted coup.